I suppose what I was going to share with you um, a, a little bit and picking up some of these threads is is what we see from our research. And for some of the, some of you who don't know me, um, I run a company called RSGI, and we've been going for about 20 years in the legal industry. We run the FT's, uh, the Innovative Lawyers Programme, but we do an awful lot of research into um, big corporate legal teams. And obviously the contracting process is all about innovation. So, um, but it covers a brave, broad range of um, tech and various other things. And I suppose, the contracting side of things, we also run specific kind of research around that. And I guess we're talking to probably about 300 odd legal teams, unique legal teams a year. And, and we've been doing it for a long time. So it's our 16th year. So we've got a lot of kind of data and benchmarks. Um, and I was going to make kind of, you know, and I suppose one of the biggest things that we do see is, is this kind of, what, you know, what we all know is a kind of effectively like a revolution in contracting. Um, and you know, I think most legal teams are having to tackle it. Uh, most companies are having to tackle it. And I, and I guess my points kind of fall into five buckets, actually. I was going to say the things that I'm just sort of asked to share, some of the things that we're seeing. Um, some of the stuff that really interests me the most, and I, and, it's, and I suppose a lot of you are going to be familiar with Oliver Hart and presumably saw the, the latest HBR article. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's really worth having a look at. Um, on kind of relational contracting um, and you can call it relational contracting or you could call it agile contracting and I think it's one of the fascinating um, movements that's happening within business because what we talk to a lot of chief procurement officers and a lot of finance CFOs as well as the general counsel and there's a real pressure coming from procurement and sales so kind of think about this whole point of ownership about you know saying well we've got to do contracting differently and if the system and the processes and the technology um, isn't working for us and we can't change this fast enough then maybe we just have to change fundamentally the way in which we do contracts so HSBC for example are talking about doing agile contracting where um, you know they kind of like don't have a defined sort of risk of uh, list of deliverables and um, there are terms that are kind of fluid within that uh, you know you see we've seen sort of um, this kind of idea of relational contracting between Accenture and Microsoft who um, have got kind of like a, you know outsourcing contracts which is all sort of focused on productivity um, and uh, you know, they, they've sort of managed to reduce sort of the number of systems that they use from like 140 to 40, so amazing kind of games. But the idea is that they, they improve the productivity in their sort of joint ventures and they sort of changed the way that they do contracting and sort of made it more kind of principles based um, and flexible and fluid and able to change quickly. And I think those are, those are quite interesting. Um, it's an interesting sort of philosophical uh, dimension to the whole contracting piece. Uh, related to that, you've got, you know, we were talking to the CPO of AstraZeneca the other day who was saying, actually, I want to have frictionless trade. And what does that mean? Um, it means, you know, just agreeing the contracts, taking the lawyers out of it, taking the contract managers out of it, and having an agreed set of terms um, that is industry wide for sort of supply contracts. And I think these are all quite dramatic moves and, and, and a reflection of the kind of um, frustration that I think people are seeing. Um, on, a, on a sort of coming down from that very big picture, I suppose, point of view, I suppose what, what we are seeing is that um, lots of companies are sort of connecting their systems. So um, the whole, you know, being able to connect your um, CLM systems to your sales systems, and, you know, the very famous example is of DXC technology, um, when they when they merged um, CSC systems and they merged about five years ago, they suddenly had tripled the volume of contracts they were doing and, um, you know, doubled in complexity, but they still managed to, um, you know, the, the legal team managed to actually handle that. And they did it through a combination of things like outsourcing, right sourcing, tech. But one of the critical things that their their head of sales said to me was 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 the reason that they they, they managed to do so well was because they connected their contracting system to Salesforce. And I suppose that's what we're seeing across the, the board, that whole the impact of enterprise wide technology. Um, you're seeing that sort of in Vodafone, for example, um, did something where they integrated their CLM system with 
ignite their CRM system and effectively um, they reckon that by, by doing that they managed to sort of lower customer churn and their contract analytics team identified 1.34 million pounds a year in additional revenue from um, customer target spend shortfalls and and I think that's you know to the whole point of value leakage when you know when you when you can do that kind of connectivity there is such huge gains to be made so other big really other really big trend is self-service that's massively sort of happening again you know using Vodafone sort of pushing that out um a big example of that is maybe Daimler and Isertis um kind of had to Daimler you can imagine it's an old German car maker completely had the same procurement system for about 25 years or something something like this was what they told us and um, within five months, they complete they changed the way that they um, procured did, did procurement, um, reduced the contracting cycle from six weeks to one week, uh, you know, and uh, being able to sort of record over five hundred thousand suppliers and obligations. They were just the efficiency gains were were kind of phenomenal. Um, and I guess we've got we've got Muhammad on the call. Um, and I suppose the last thing I'd say, um, you know, which I think is and you sort of haven't talked about this, but I guess it's sort of to the the idea of the the what is happening within the contracting space was the whole idea of visual contracting, um, which which Shell obviously did with um, the WCC or the IACCM um, uh, beforehand. But it's really I think, you know, thinking about um, uh, thinking about the kind of uh, uh, the the benefits of visual contracting i think it's um, muhammad you're going to correct me if i'm wrong but um it's like 8000 procurement contracts are automatically generated a year and now 70% of the contracts are now reviewed and sent back without needing the human touch i mean so but i think you know these are all sort of um movements forward the other point i'd actually say is an, another thing around um, which i think we haven't really mentioned is is design thinking um accenture has trained a thousand sort of of its contract uh sort of management staff and design thinking and again sort of trying to take a more big picture human touch to um to the contracting and and again I suppose fundamentally in that is getting back to that whole question of why why are we doing this what's the purpose of it um and, and making contracting a much more sort of human-centered um, process, but also one where risk is evaluated in quite a in quite a different way. So that's my very very quick ten minutes of 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 the big trends. I suppose it's relational contracting, agile contracting, moving towards fictionless trade, which is the big kind of philosophical thing, and then obviously it's connecting systems, self service, and then this whole impact of design thinking and and visual contracting.